comes. He will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will said that he was mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, praise Lord Christ. In the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, we always accept the evil in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome Trinity Sunday. This is the only Sunday of the church year when we celebrate a doctrine rather than some part of Jesus' life. I remember very well in a seminary by one of my professors, Richard Spielman, saying, on Trinity Sunday, heresy is preached in every church in the land. So for the first several years, I tried to make real sure that I didn't preach on Trinity Sunday, which when I was an assistant, uh, that was always kind of a fun thing because the rector didn't want to preach on He wanted to bomb it off on me. The point of the seminary professor and the point of most clergy's uncomfortableness with preaching on the Trinity is that we are talking about God and God is what we can comprehend. And therefore, every human attempt to comprehend and delineate what God is and what God isn't falls short. We either overemphasize Jesus or overemphasize the Spirit or overemphasize the Father, the Creator. Add on to that our modern sensitivity to language. When I was growing up, I learned the Trinity was the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Uh, given when I first went to church and the Sunday school I went to, uh, the Holy Ghost was really right. I remember my teacher, we were all huddled in one little corner of what seemed like a huge, vast space in the basement of an 18-something church which is where we held Sunday school. And I remember the teacher saying, God is always right behind you, just over your shoulder. And I remember looking back, and there were these dark crevices, and I thought, well, I guess God's better than any of the ghosts I'm thinking might be lurking back there. So we learned to stumbling change into Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. But we still ended up with two male images, God the Father and God the Son. In modern times, we've attempted to, to lessen that male singularly uh, emphasis by depicting the Holy Spirit as a female. And indeed, our first reading, which is about wisdom, is referring to what we would call the Holy Spirit. And then it's very popular to talk about God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Nice, we got rid of the male language, right? We got rid of the ghosts, we got rid of everything that, except creator, redeemer, and sustainer are all actions, persons. And the Trinity declares God as one in three persons. And it is true that the act of what we grew up calling God the Father is the creative act, the creation of all that is, including you and me. And certainly it is true that Jesus was sent by God and takes on human form in order to redeem us even more importantly than God's work of redemption, which we could get into a real mire on, is that God took on human form to show you and me 
be, how to live our lives, how how it intends us to live as human beings. And certainly, God the Holy Spirit sustains us our everyday life. And so those functions of God do help us understand the Trinity. Now on Trinity Sunday, I'm grateful I'm an Episcopalian. Because one of the things that Episcopalians are really good at, I think, I don't get it. And if I do get it, I probably got it wrong. And so I always have to be open to new information. To the fact that something might come that might clarify and change my mind. Many of our Christian brothers and sisters seek to define and to get God in good parameters. Roman Catholics do it, evangelical Christians do it. And see that in the various understandings of the Eucharist, which we will celebrate just a little bit. In the Roman Catholic Church, they believe that in the Eucharist, the elements of the body of, of bread and wine are actually physically changed into the body and blood of Christ, even though it still looks like bread and wine to me, and not the tastiest bread. In the Lutheran Church, they have a different understanding. For some reason right now, both we'll have patience. What are the two to for for communion? Communion concept. Thank you. Consubstantiation is the Roman Catholic. Consubstantiation is the Lutheran. They say it's still bread and wine, but it's actually the body and blood of Christ. Good Anglicans simply say. We have the doctrine of the real presence. We have no idea how God does it. All we know is God is present once that bread and wine has been consecrated, that God has entered in, and when we partake of communion to us in a special and sacramental way, now we don't understand how God does it. Still looks like bread, still looks like actually it looks like fish food and still looks like wine, but we know through our experience that God is fully present there, that something forms and happens within us that strengthens us, that allows us to be more Christ-like throughout the week for having received the sacrament. And I think that maybe is the strength of this Trinity Sunday for us who are Episcopalians is we don't have to pretend to understand it. We don't have to pretend to be, we don't have to define it. We simply have to understand its meaning. And when we really think about it, what the doctrine of the Trinity is saying is that God is a God of relationship, that within the very being of God, there were these three aspects in constant relationship and interaction. And that, that example of God in God's self is the example of our living together. That we are meant to be people living in relationship, in relationship to God and in relationship to one another. And I think that that is a very key factor in this day and age when we have been so isolated and so separated, both because of the pandemic, but then because of the politics of our age, because of the violence of our age, because of the fear that seems to be swishing around in the very ethos around us. Hang on to the God we worship. It's a God of relationship. A God who desires a personal and life-giving and strengthening relationship with us. And a God who desires us to be in deep, meaningful, redeeming relationships with one another. And so, so on this Trinity Sunday, if we can go from this place to understanding and more dedicated to the fact that we are 
as humans be at our core, relational beings. And then just because of the infamy, I have to say, if any English teacher or anyone else would like to diagram the uh, collect for the day, and then give me a, a, a definition of what in the world it's saying. I read it slowly, that's because it doesn't make sense. It's like confession of true faith, the glory of the eternal trinity, the worship of the unity. What are we saying there, folks? Except that God is beyond our understanding. And thank God, God understands us and welcomes and includes us in God's love. Let us stand and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Thank you. Patience, I thought I could get you on that one. <laughs> Would you, as a teacher, have ever allowed somebody to write that as one sentence? Well, I, I was never a teacher.